Perfect. I think we are set. All right. Good morning. Good evening. My name is Felipe. I am part of the Charter for Compassion family staff. I'm here to welcome you to our Global Read series, web, Global Read webinar series of this year. We are super excited to be hosting uh, the, the conversation with today is going to be Everyday Ubuntu, Living Better Together, The African Way. This book was written by Mungi Ngomane, and our facilitator is going to be our friend Babala Nkongolo, who is um, part of the Board of Trustees, also was a director of the Ubuntu Festival that happened a couple of weeks ago. She's in South Africa, and I'm so happy to have both of them here with us so that we can share more time um, talking about um, the, the Ubuntu and the book that Mungi wrote. So with that, let me stop sharing my screen. And I, um, the floor is yours, my friend. Awesome. Thank you so much, Felipe. It's such an honor to be able to be here today and be joined by someone as dynamic, as illustrious, as accomplished as Mungi Ngomani. Um, we had just the pleasure of diving deep into this wonderful book that um, Mungi has, has, has written. Um, and it's really it's such a labor of love to your country, to the legacy of your grandfather as well. And so I'm so excited to have this conversation with Mungi. And I'm excited to have everyone join us today. Um, I will just do a quick introduction of Mungi. Um, it would take me the whole day if I were to <laughs> go through every single thing that Mungi has done um, so, so far. But I, I do want to just point on, you know, to some of the highlights, um, Mungi. Um, so Mungi is a, an author, she's a human rights activist and operations leader, a project manager who's passionate and she's a passionate advocate for the Middle East, for peace, for women's rights, and of course the philosophy of Ubuntu. Mungi collaborates with global organizations and startups to create meaningful impact. Um, Mungi has a background in management consulting. She excels in strategy, project management, and interpersonal communication. Um, yeah, Mungi currently is the managing director of Mungi Global LLC. Um, and most recently, she was uh, she is a senior associate at Banff Advisors. And Mungi, uh, her work really centers around working alongside communities of exceptional leaders dedicated to growth and development. She's collaborated with numerous impact-driven clients to shape and expand their initiatives um, and, yeah, has worked with incredible organizations. Uh, Mungi, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Very excited. Um, you know, I, I really want to go deep into this book. It's, it, as I've said, it's such a beautiful labor of love. And I, I really want, I'm interested to find out what was the inspiration for this book, um, particularly because it it's such an important text, I think, for our times. But uh, yeah, I'm very interested uh, what that inspiration was for you. So people always ask me this question and I have to sort of warn them, like it's not a sexy, like inspiring story. I um, actually was like between roles and sort of trying to figure out what my life's work was going to be. And someone reached out to me on LinkedIn and I was like, oh, this is a scam. Like who is asking about Ubuntu on LinkedIn and wants to learn more about it? Um, but fast forward, like six months later, this person ended up being my book editor. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the background behind it was someone had sort of written a book about different philosophies and Ubuntu had been brought forward. And the publisher was really interested in learning more about Ubuntu. And they had seen an article I'd written at the end of 2016, right after the Trump election. And it was, I just remember darkness, but it was just a very heartfelt article where I sort of just like spilled all of my emotions and the emotions of my friends that I had been dealing with um, on the page and shared a lot of how my mom, you know, had had compared what was happening in the U.S. in that moment to different moments in South Africa and, and growing up under apartheid. And so just very emotional piece that was cathartic for me. And my editor ended up saying that she liked the way I wrote. And that's why she had asked if I mm -hmm. could write this book about Ubuntu, also considering the family connection. And I was like, you know what? I don't have a job. So yeah. I'll try it. And then this is what happened from it. Uh, 
I cannot say that I did it alone. I think what I like to say about the book is there were so many people involved that it was like Ubuntu made the book what it is. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, I think it's it it really reads as a, a, a collaboration, right? That there's so many interesting parts um, of the book that really speak to the spirit of Ubuntu living, right, through that text. Um, I I I I find it interesting, the concept of Ubuntu. I think it means so many different things to so many different people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we recently wrapped up the Ubuntu Festival and one of the questions, the running questions throughout it was, uh, what does Ubuntu mean to you? And I'm I'm interested to find out what are the, what what are you connecting with when you speak to Ubuntu? What does that word, uh, what what power does it hold for you? Uh, you know, as, as a person who's written this book, who obviously is connected to, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who used the term um, so eloquently as we transitioned into democracy in South Africa. Um, what does it mean to you, uh, particularly in today's times? I like that you asked it that way, because I've realized over the years, the way I've explained it has, you know, at the baseline stayed the same. But depending on what I'm feeling in my life at the moment, there are certain sort of what you'd say pillars that stand out to me. Um, and so I, I think the way that I describe it now in this moment is sort of the acknowledgement of the humanity that I share with those around me, those that I know and those that I love, but also those that I don't know, and and the need to remember how intertwined our lives are. Um, it always sticks with me as the book came out of two months before COVID sort of hit. And I remember I was in the UK talking at a festival about the book. And the morning I was getting ready for it, I had heard an article about this virus in China. And for a split second, I thought, oh, what if that came here? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, no, it's fine. I mean, hello, that that is that is what happened. And so we are so interconnected. And I, I think that Ubuntu is about acknowledging it and knowing that we are made for connection. And, you know, what really stands out to me in this moment is that no man is an island. And so I have this sort of like shtick where I really don't like when people say they're self-made because I'm like, when we were born, we did not bathe ourselves. We did not feed ourselves. In every moment, someone has been there, even in the moments where we felt alone, someone at least got us there. Someone taught us. And so, you know, I think it's just about in... The, the good moments and in the dark moments, remembering that we are made for, you know, collaboration and cooperation. I love that. I love that. We are, right? We are connected. Yeah. And what you speak so beautifully, I mean, when you break it down, you know, it's this idea that I am because you are. And it's just the acknowledgement, as you've said, of this deep, intricate connection that we have mm -hmm. um, that we can't run away from, right? Um, and I think COVID, as you said, completely highlighted that, right? It it really made us dig deep into um, our need for connection with each other and, and to recognize it. Um, and I think part of that connection, though, is a very difficult reality as well. And I love how the book covers these 14 different aspects of what I would say Ubuntu, right? Or 14 different ways to engage with it. Um, and I think it speaks to uh, something that we tend to shy away from as a society, which is the idea of the ruptures, the the pain, the struggles, mm -hmm. the difficulties that sometimes impede on our ability to really do the thing of Ubuntu, of connecting, right? Um, I, I'm interested to know, um, just in crafting those 14 different sort of principles, um, what are the ones that you think are important um, maybe you can just speak to some of them. And what are the ones that you think are are important for our time today um, in the world that we're living in, um, the crises that we're seeing? Um, what do you think are the sort of important ones for us to hold on to? So the one that I think is, is my favorite and is the one that I think I'm constantly learning about and also one that I think is one that I really want women to hold on to is the having respect for yourself and others, but in that I want the for yourself to be the one, the dignity and respect, because I think so often we, you know, we're the last thought when it's, when we're thinking about our family and our friends, like we put ourselves last 
And we know that like society does so much better when women are actually taken care of and are at the helm and, you know, are leaders. And so that one is one that I have sort of struggled with. What is me showing dignity and respect for myself? And what is maybe me being too rigid in how I, you know, hold people to account when it comes to, let's say, boundaries or how they treat me? And there, you know, there've been moments where I've definitely been wrong, but it's, it's something that I have focused on and and thought, you know, if I'm going to treat you with respect, I have to also treat myself with respect and I have to teach you how to treat me. And so I will do that. And um, it's been a difficult one, but it's one that I absolutely love. And then one that I think is very important for our time is acknowledging the reality of where we are. Um, Something that my therapist always says to me is, you know, we have to accept what is. Accepting what is doesn't mean we think it's acceptable, but Mm -hmm. we're at least acknowledging it is happening. Because if we don't acknowledge that it's happening, how can we get anywhere? And it makes me think of um, the book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast, where she talks about how when we think of America, it's, you know, the society that, yes, the people who built it aren't here and, and we were not responsible for what was built, but we're living here now. And so the way she explains it is she's like, yeah, you may not have been responsible for building the structure of the house, but if your house is going to fail, you're going to fix your house. And so I think, you know, this whole, I wasn't here for slavery. I wasn't here for apartheid, all of this, like, that's fine, but you're here now. So let's yeah. accept the reality of where these people have left us and let's agree on where we can go. But if we're not going to even accept the reality, we can't even acknowledge where we want to go to next. Um, So I think that's very important because, you know, in this sort of polarizing moment with every issue under the sun, um, we have people who don't acknowledge the truth anymore. So, I mean, the battle is like, we're starting at like minus five, I think. Um, so I, I think the acknowledgement is really important. And then the lesson that I know my grandfather would say, you know, is the most important is forgiveness. But I'll be honest and say that I really struggled writing about forgiveness because it's a hard thing. It sounds nice and fluffy, but I really struggled with it because I found it difficult to say if something happens to a woman and your body is violated you should forgive this person. If I'm not in those shoes, how can I tell that? And so that one was one where, you know, on the face of it, I get it. That is that is where we want to get to. You don't want the poison to sort of sit in your body. But it it's one that's important, but I'm still struggling with what does forgiveness actually mean for all of us? And can you forgive if someone has not offered sort of, you know, remorse it, you know it i think it's supposed to be a reciprocal relationship and sometimes we are like oh i'm just going to forgive because i don't want this sitting with me but is is that what forgiveness is that that is something i as you can tell i'm still struggling with mm. i i it's such an important i think um uh idea to grapple with right that idea of forgiveness and it i think it's it's such a difficult one in our contexts um mm particularly because forgiveness sometimes has been used as a tool to silence those who are um, disadvantaged or those who are oppressed in a system. Um, Some people are always expected to forgive and some people do not have to forgive. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And I think what's interesting is in reading it is that, and reading what you'd wrote around forgiveness, I think is that it also calls us into a new way of thinking through what forgiveness is. There's a writer, and I'm forgetting their name now, who speaks about, um, you know, a f- forgiveness is only really valuable if you change the circumstances that allowed the wrongdoing to occur in the first place. Mm-hmm. And so if we haven't done that work yet, you know, how do we then, how do we sit in a space of forgiveness? Um, right. But also how can we be more responsible around what we mean when we speak about forgiveness? And I love that in the book, 
uh, and I love that you've said it here that it's it's challenging to 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 just say forgive. I think that there is a deep sort of analysis we need to go into, um, as you've spoken so beautifully about. Um, I find it fascinating, absolutely fascinating, what you spoke to about just at the beginning there about um, uh, women, um, our relationships with ourselves in particular. Mm -hmm. Right. And how we we nourish that around Ubuntu, because, you know, Ubuntu seems like this term that really sits around. How do we give to others? How do we, um, you know, be in connection? And I, I'm, I'm really keen to hear more about what you mean when you say um, that it really is about, uh, in some ways, self-preservation or honoring of self, I think, is a better way to speak to it. But I, I would love to hear you speak more just about what that means in the context of Ubuntu and, you know, living Ubuntu in the everyday. Yeah, I think honoring of self is a great way to say it. And something I always like to sort of say in the beginning is what I love about this philosophy is I think it's something that you, you know, I've written about it, but I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it. I don't think you can sort of ever be an expert on Ubuntu. I think it's, an, you know, an everyday learning Um and so with that is the learning about sort of what I need to be the moongi that I want to be for the people in my life. And yeah. and so this self-love, self, you know, understanding, I think only helps those that you are in relationship with. Because when I know what is happening in, in my life and in the hard moments, the sad moments, the happy moments, I can better communicate this to people. What I what it makes me think of is I um have worked for different like tech companies and corporate companies and um I once had a feedback review session that didn't speak at all about my work, but it spoke about how when I have good energy, I have an energy that galvanizes and then mm -hmm. when I don't, it's really felt by everyone. And I was like, oh, so did did I hurt someone's feelings? Like what? I don't know what you're trying to say. People are not happy all the time. I'm I'm a black woman in America. I'm not going to be happy all the time. I got to be honest with you. Um, And we we couldn't get to the crux of it. There was nothing. There was no sort of, you know, solid evidence about what it was. And so I just finally had to say. I have a full life outside of my work. And so if you assume that my sort of down demeanor on one day has to do with you, then there's a lot of work that you have to do. Hmm. This has nothing to do with me. I understand that I'm allowed to have a sad day. I'm allowed to be upset about something, still be kind, but I may not, you know, want to sit and giggle and laugh and that's okay. And if you felt the same way, I wouldn't assume that I did something because you were an adult and I'm an adult. I think you would tell me if I did do something. Otherwise, I assume in your full life outside of this job, something else happened. And so, you know, in the beginning, I was sort of uncomfortable. I personally have not gotten feedback like that before. I was like, I'd rather you just tell me I did a bad job of my work or something. Because how, how am I going to fix this? This personality is almost 32 years old. It's not changing now. Mm -hmm. um, but I just came to realize, okay, there are definitely moments I can be a little nicer. Um, and I can, you know, I can acknowledge if maybe someone's a little sensitive, but also in this moment, I know who I am. I know how I show up because of this time that I've spent with Ubuntu and with myself and having dignity for myself. And in this moment, I think it's about how I come off as a black woman. I don't think, I don't think it's how I'm treating you. And if you can't mm -hmm. give me the concrete answers, then I can't change my behavior. And I don't think if this had happened like five years ago, I would have been able to sort of get through a conversation in that way or to come out on the other side and say, maybe it's not, this moment is not my work to do. You know, sometimes you have to ask yourself, what is yours? I have a little post-it note on my computer that says like, what is my work to do? Because sometimes it's not your work. Mm -hmm. And women, we want to do everyone's work. But there's no time. So let's focus on our own work. Um, and and maybe that'll teach people to do theirs as well. 
Mm. I, I, yeah, I think that connects beautifully to this idea that Ubuntu is a, it's a responsibility <clears throat> and it's a responsibility first and foremost to yourself. Um, mm. And I think there's, there's, there's work sometimes that we have to do around um, unpacking our own, um, you know, what is ours and what is someone else's as you've, as you've beautifully sort of right. spoken to. Our triggers and our traumas and. Absolutely. Yeah. Like that process is so important. And when we speak about Ubuntu, when we speak about being in relationship with others um, and connected to others, I think the first connection is with ourselves. Um, and it's just this idea that number one, we can't pour from an in, empty cup. But also number two, as you've said, right, the the there is there is a need to understand um, how sometimes the way we are categorized in our society does the work of dehumanizing ourselves. And Ubuntu is that work of rehumanizing, literally seeing Mungi as more than just the job that she's doing here, or a happy face, or um, you know, a caricature of a black professional, right? That you are a full, full human being, and that's just work that is it speaks so powerfully to the essence of Ubuntu. Um, and I'm so glad that you spoke to it in, in that way. Um, what is your everyday Ubuntu is something I'm interested in. What is your practice of everyday Ubuntu? So if you ask anyone that knows me, I'm very good at sleeping. And I use sleep as a reward, but also as a, a way to sometimes avoid things. Mm. Um, and and so my current everyday Ubuntu practice is I have taken almost, I'm taking six months off of alcohol. And what that has taught me is to learn how to sit in every emotion that you feel. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my mom has always said to people, if you are feeling sad, then just be sad. She's, you know, she used to have chocolate hidden in her bedroom from us so that when she was sad, she could just lock the door and eat the chocolate and watch, you know, murder mysteries. And now I find myself, if I'm sad, I'll be sad in my bed and I will too watch murder mysteries. Mm. But instead of trying to avoid those emotions by working out or sleeping or, you know, or just doing anything to avoid them. I've learned that I, I can sit through it. I can sit through the sadness and sometimes it's difficult. And sometimes, you know, people don't really know how to take it. I was sad one day a few weeks ago and I told my husband and he like had no idea what to do. And he just was like, well, I hope you feel better. Like, well, that's going to definitely help. Thank you. Um, But I think just allowing myself to be the complex as you said person that I am and so feeling every emotion feeling also the emotions of others I you know I as a woman again I take on a lot and so sometimes I have learned to say to people in this moment I don't have the tools to help and I know that I will try to go into that fixing mode if I engage right now and I can't because I know on the back end of it I'm going to be flat out yeah. and so if I can help you find the tools I will but I cannot be that sort of vessel to hold it right now um and those are difficult conversations when you want to help everyone and yeah. and be there for everyone that you know something about my self-worth was I always wanted to be the friend who knew what to say why mm. I don't have to always know what to say I can just be there um and so I think my everyday Ubuntu is sort of taking Mungi as she is that day and making sure that I'm not causing harm to others, but allowing everything else that, that comes with it. Mm. Beautiful. What's yours? <laughs> oh, no, there'll be another. <laughs> Should I answer that? I think, yes. as you said, my everyday Ubuntu, uh, yeah, actually, it's a great question. Um, and I think my everyday Ubuntu is um like you've said honoring of self in many different ways um but i think my honoring of ubuntu is understanding spaces where um we can do more to um give voice to the voiceless um mm -hmm. i think ubuntu is a beautiful concept and it speaks to 
um, it speaks to so many things. It speaks to giving. And I think you're speaking beautifully into pouring into yourself and giving also yourself the grace that we offer to others. Um, I think for me, every day, my everyday want to go is what are the small ways that I can be a participant in a system that sometimes does not have Ubuntu, mm -hmm. um, but how can I bring that into that system? Um, and it, it really is small things. Um, and I don't want to toot my horn, so I'm not going to say <laughs> more than that, but I think All right, that you can is toot it later. My, my everyday Ubuntu. I just want to quickly check um, if we have any questions from those who are uh, watching either on Facebook or um, uh, who have joined us on the webinar. Um, I, have a, I, can, I, can, I can give you the questions right here. Yes, please. Um, so Marge asked, I believe we also need systemic change. This is a question at the beginning of things. Any advice on moving forward systemically? Mm -hmm. This is one that is tough. If I'm honest, I don't think there is an answer. This is something that, you know, I and myself and sort of in my activism, I'm struggling with. Um, I think systematically what we need to ask ourselves and something I am trying to redirect myself is, does my sort of activism and my work come from fear or does it come from love? Because if it comes from fear, it's not sustainable and it is it won't be sustainable for any of us. Um, and so are we coming from a place of love in, in the work that we're doing? Acknowledging that there are scary things happening, but that fear won't galvanize us for long enough. Um, and so how can we sort of make that switch to coming from love where there are moments where we will take a break and that's okay because there will be someone else to sort of pick up the mantle um, and then get back in the fight because the love that we have for those that we don't know or for those that we've seen suffer things that we don't think someone should ever suffer again um, will we'll sort of, you know, light our fire. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Next question. How can Ubuntu be manifest slash transform a global economic system that is based on separation and competition? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Who asked this? Um, <laughs> uh, again, this is a tough one. I will say the thing about Ubuntu is what I'm what I've written and what I'm speaking of is what I'm learning, like in real time. And so I don't think I have an answer for that. Um, I think it would take a lot of different leadership and leadership styles, but also like the the way that we look to leaders. Um, you you know, we shouldn't have this sort of cult of personality and cult of celebrity because then we sort of allow wrongdoings that we don't allow in our own, you know, sort of smaller sex and societies. Um, so this is, I'm not answering this right because honestly, this is what I struggle with. But if the person who asked the question has a suggestion, I would love to hear that. Sadly, yeah. the question the question was asked anonymously, so I have no idea uh, who you I think also though, what's really beautiful about the, the book um, is that it speaks to everyday ways of, um, mm -hmm. of living Ubuntu. And I think what that speaks to is just the ability to use that um, as part of, as the way that we live and we navigate the system. I think we we are very eager to, to shift systems. It's a big question, it's a difficult one, um, but, what I love about the book is that it speaks to how do we dignify each other in our in these very intimate moments, in these very personal moments, and then how do we then, you know, and then that being sort of the catalyst to what we're asking in terms of systemic change, because right. the system is huge. It, it is exactly. huge. Mm. And it takes time to change systems and concerted effort. Um, and I will I will say, you know, Another reason that it was important for me to sort of write it the way I did is because when I was learning about Ubuntu for my family growing up, it was always from this religious lens. And yeah. 
to my family's chagrin, I am not religious. Um, mm-hmm. But I think Ubuntu is still so applicable. And mm-hmm. so I wanted it to be something where, okay, maybe this becomes the sort of, you know, calling and philosophy that you look to if you don't feel connected to a higher power or to, you know, someone else's God. Um, mm-hmm. And so this is sort of how I, in my own little way, am trying to change the system. Um, and it's, you know, person by person, but we'll we'll see where we get. In terms of the, you've done incredible work with, with women, women's rights, um, and I think most recently a lot of work in the Middle East. I want to, you know, we hear so many different stories that are actually very difficult to to um, engage with. And I think the the act of Ubuntu, of being human, is that we need to engage with them. But I, I wanted to know, how does Ubuntu, um, how does it show up in that work in particular? Um, is there uh, is there work uh, within that work? Are there examples where you see Ubuntu as a living testament of what is possible? Um, yeah, are there are there are there stories that we haven't yet heard or seen in the work that you you do that speak powerfully to Ubuntu? Um, so I think there's one story that I that maybe is in the book. I can't remember. Um, where. A few years ago, uh, my husband and I went to the Middle East and he was someone who had not truly heard about, you know, what was happening in Israel and Palestine back in 2017 um, and didn't really understand why it was so important for me to go. I had been studying Arabic. I had sort of been studying this since I was 15 um, and so took him along with me and we spent about two weeks between Israel and Palestine. And and in Palestine, we, you know, stayed in a family's home, um, a family that had two daughters, and I want to say five sons. And they welcomed like five of a party of 20 strange Americans to come stay in their home for one night. This is a home that has been certain rooms demolished by the IDF. All of this woman's sons have at one point been detained and you would have no idea. And the sort of generosity that was showed to us is how could it be anything other than Ubuntu? And what's so funny about that is, you know, that is what foreigners would always say when they come to South Africa. They'd be like, oh, my God, and the smiles and the singing and the music and the da 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 And they'd be like, but they were so welcoming, even if, you know, we were like in Soweto and like zone three in someone's house, whatnot. Um, but they were so welcoming and gave us anything they had. And the same thing happened in Palestine. And I'm like, what? It has to be Ubuntu. It, it, it can't be anything else. And so seeing that. And then knowing all that I have and, and, you know, in the book, we talk about gratitude and gratitude practices and whatever, but like it, gratitude is nothing compared to what these people have shown and, and continue to show. And so I think the work is sort of an everyday reminder of Ubuntu, whether it's Ubuntu that we are showing or that we have received for people when, you know, I don't feel like I deserve that sort of generosity from someone that I've just met halfway across the world. Um, And so I think that part of the reason I do the work is because it, there is something there that feels like Ubuntu. The other reason is I I do sort of see my South African-ness in people in the Middle East and, you know, the struggles that they go to go through and the way that they show up in those struggles and, when we spoke in the beginning about, you know, people are expected to forgive it, it, so many moments, so many things that we do to these people. And then still the grace that they show us, I just, I just, I, I can't imagine. Yeah. And there's something powerful in seeing the best in people 
and people showing up as the kindest, the most graceful version of themselves in situations that are just the, the most um, painful and the most difficult. Um, and I think that's when we see just the, the spirit of humanity really exactly. come through. Right? And the strength it's, of the human spirit. The strength of the human spirit. That I think is is exactly it, right? Is the strength of the human spirit, the tenacity, the ability to to continue to go on even in difficult um, difficult circumstances. Um, I'm I'm curious though, just within that, um, within the work that you you do, um, what are what are some elements that you think um, the world needs to adopt, particularly? um around this idea of ubuntu um in the work that you've done and the work and even the story that you've just you know you've shared right now um there is something you said at the beginning around there are very specific people who are expected to forgive and there are specific people who are expected to have ubuntu i'm i'm curious what the lesson around that in the story that you've just told us now um around you know, how we shift the practice of Ubuntu and how we shift who we expect Ubuntu is meant to be done by um, or who is meant to experience it. Um, yeah. I think some of that comes from how comfortable we are, not just, and when I say the word policing, I don't mean physical police on the street, in policing people's words and thoughts. And in this current moment, I think about it when I see activists who, you know, we admire and we learn so much from, we then see them policing the words of Palestinians, but they're the ones experiencing it. Something that they say may not be palatable, but if I am not experiencing that situation, I can't truly tell you how to respond because I don't know how I would respond in that moment. And so I think the listening is so important. Um, you know, this goes to me too. It'd be great if we all listened a bit more. Um, but also the sort of putting ourselves in the shoes of others, which we don't always want to do. But if I were to put myself in any Palestinian shoes right now, I have no idea where I would be and what I would be saying. I hope that I would have the strength of human spirit that I have seen, but I don't know because I've not had to experience that. I have a roof over my head. You know, I am in a comfortable position. And so who am I to sit here and judge from this sort of like tower of mine, how someone is living or as I think that we should say surviving. You know, there's no thriving happening right now. I think a lot of us are just surviving. And so, you you know, our responses and our reactions are just that. But instead of being people that want to speak for others, and, you know, you said the, the voice for the voiceless, let's platform because no one's voiceless. Let's mm. give them our platforms so that people can listen to them yeah. because I don't, my voice doesn't always matter in certain moments. I think, you know, there are some messages that I'm here to deliver, but I don't always need to be the messenger. And so sometimes I need to allow other people to be the messenger in the moment. And I don't know if it has to do with the sort of like fastness of social media and, you know, you have to be first and there and you have to be the one to say it. But like, we don't always have to be the messenger of something. We can let other ones be the speakers and we can just sort of sit and listen and, and sit in discomfort and sit in knowledge. Like there, there's so much we can learn from listening to others. Um, so I think probably the most important lesson at this moment would be listening and, mm -hmm. and less, yeah, less policing, less tone policing, less, you know, let's do less harm to others. Yeah that I think brilliantly said right there's so much power we can do so much more when you've listened truly mm -hmm. listened right um and allowed people the space fully um to be heard that's exactly. I think 
Yeah, that's that's part of what I think is definitely missing. And I think it's such a beautiful call is if we're not listening, can we take a moment to listen? Um, particularly, and I like what you said, not to those who are, who are voiceless, but who have been silenced, right? That is the the important the important point I, I think it's beautifully said um I want to I want to also just give a chance for some questions that we've received um uh, um from those who've joined us Felipe um can you yes just share I'm here <laughs> yeah so um remember the question that I was asking you know how can Ubuntu be manifest or transform a global economic system that is based on separation and competition the mm -hmm. same person later wrote Perhaps the response is communities finding ways to engage in regenerative economics. Mm -hmm. Maybe like follow the work of Donut Economics by Kay Raworth. So thanks for that. I appreciate that. Whoever wrote that. Oh, so, yeah. Um, the other question that was asked is, do you see love, compassion, and Ubuntu as practices we can effectively use for systemic change? Mm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think... I think love and compassion are found within Ubuntu, um, but I think Ubuntu sort of combines them to add, you know, the other things we've discussed, such as dignity and respect and acknowledgement and acceptance, acceptance of bad things, not that they're acceptable again, but that, you know, they are happening. And so how can we sort of change the system of what's happening? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask a South African, I think they would say, yes, there were many things that helped end apartheid, but Ubuntu was a very important part of apartheid ending and also, you know, South Africa becoming what it is today. Um, and then the fact that so many other countries have sort of taken the example of the TRC, which mm -hmm. was, again, not perfect. I'm very comfortable saying it was not the most perfect setup. But it got us to where we are. And so many other countries have taken that example. And I think the TRC was Ubuntu sort of personified. We had to accept and hear horrendous things to be able to get to the next step. And so I, I think, yes, Ubuntu is, is definitely needed for sort of any systemic change that we want to be sustainable. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, yeah, I think beautifully said. Um, because, I mean, and there are a lot of theories around Ubuntu economics and what Ubuntu politics can look like. Mm -hmm. um, but I love even just what you've spoken about around the TRC um, and um, how that was a moment of deep listening. That was a moment um, that, and quite interestingly, for the first time in the history of South Africa, we had this televised um uh, you know, opportunity to witness, deeply, deeply witness some of the, the the painful atrocities. But from that came, you know, there's nowhere to hide when the truth is right. there. And we can, as you said earlier, radically accept um, that this is what it is. And from that place, we can then, you know, um, move. We can do something and shift something. Um, so I, 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 I deeply resonate, as a South African, I deeply resonate with, you know, um that answer um and i think it speaks to um more of what we need to be focusing on i think there's so many big ways that this work can be done um and i think uh what the book does and what you do in your work is to say but where, what are the small ways that we can be practicing that because that i don't think we have down pat down pat yet those are things that we still need to and I think it's also very much about we don't have to all do it the same way. You know, yeah. we are all here with different gifts for a reason. And so my way does not need to be the same way as someone else's. But if I am like living fully in who Mungi is and sharing my gifts, then it's mm -hmm. going to get us to the next step that I can get us to. And then, you know, people can share their gifts in different ways. And so instead of sort of focusing on how horrendous we think the difference is. Like what actually can the difference help us get to? Mm. Mm. I, and not fearing the difference, right? right. Embracing the difference. Because it's not right. going anywhere and we didn't necessarily choose it. So yeah. let's lean into it. Yeah. Yeah. It brings so many gifts when we 
are affording ourselves the space to just be diverse and mm. to you know we not have to conform i think is is a is a wonderful way to engage with, with each other um we are nearing the end of our time um and i am so grateful that we've had the opportunity to to have this conversation with you um and i'm so grateful for what you've offered us in in terms of your own gift which is this book that that you've written um and i just you know as we close um i'm wondering if um there is there's any particular lesson from the book in particular or maybe from your work that mm -hmm. you would like for us to to really um hold on to um uh you know as we just as we close um yeah if there's a particular message um from the book and yeah that you would like for us to to take forth yeah i think the one that we all need in this moment even myself is this sort of believe in the good of everyone mm. now this is not to say ignore the quote you know the quote when people show you who they are believe them i believe that so when people are showing us who they are we need to believe them we need to be aware because also that is just a safety thing like you need to keep yourself safe but i think in the moments where we don't know we could do so much better to listen and assume the best intention because it stops us from a being defensive and from someone else feeling that we are actually instead being offensive towards them. Um, and so, you know, if someone knocks into me in the street or if I just saw the bus driver earlier, like drive past someone I'm going to assume he didn't, maybe he didn't see the person. I don't think he was trying to be mean. Can we do a little bit more of that? Because when someone assumes bad intentions from me, it really hurts me. Yeah. I, you know, that is not what I'm trying to do. And so please, you know, in, in those moments, ask what could, what else could be happening? Remember, there's so much more happening in people's lives that it could have been something that happened when they were five years old that is currently a trauma pain picture for them and they were triggered and it's now they're sort of throwing it up on you, but they didn't mean to. Yeah. Um, and so I think maybe if we were all just a little more gentle with each other and, you know, believed in the good of each other, we may get somewhere. There are so many more of us that are good than that are not. So you know, let's, let's seek out those people and sort of be in community with them. Mm -hmm. The power of curiosity, I think is what sticks out to me. There, there you right? go. I like that. Very good. It's, it's powerful to be curious, but to, you know, allowing your curiosity to lead you to the best in, in people, mm -hmm. I think is a powerful statement tonight. And when you're surprised, like it's so refreshing and so amazing. And maybe there is, you know, a new relationship that comes from that. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah I think that's a that's a wonderful way to to um to conclude our conversation I think it's this the idea of holding on to the curiosity um being curious about what makes us human being curious about you know the best of who we are as people um speaks so beautifully to this yeah to that that idea of um and um yeah seeking what what are the generous assumptions that we can make right. about us and about our humanity and who we are? Um, I'm so grateful, Mungi, for, you know, you joining us today, for you giving us uh, your time, for sharing so much about the book. Um, and I think uh, everyone needs to, <laughs> needs to read this book. Thank you. Um, it's definitely... Uh, I, I, as someone who's been who's been diving into just the concept of Ubuntu, found so much, um, so much connection with it. I think there were parts where I was also challenged, um, and I think the depth and honesty that the book goes into around how we practice Ubuntu in our in our everyday in our communities within ourselves um, is such a beautiful and powerful call uh, to to each and every one. It's a call to action. Um, and I, I really appreciate that we have the opportunity to engage with it. And I hope others will also engage with the book. Um, I know Lynn has shared a link to the book in, in the, um, in, 
the in the chat um and i'm sure it will also be shared elsewhere um and yeah i think uh it's it's wonderful to to have you join us i just wanted to quickly ask as we close are there any closing remarks um anything that you'd like to say before we we shift off to the next sort of portion of today's webinar um i think i would say you know ubuntu can be humbling in moments uh there you know there are still times where i realize i really did not listen to someone and either my mother will tell me that um or my therapist will and i will be really humbled and sort of like okay that that was on me and so i think being okay with being humbled in moments and acknowledging that we don't know everything has probably made me a better person and nicer to some um so I think you know just be gracious and humble and I will say the one thing that has always sort of helped me when I'm feeling down is to sort of channel Ubuntu and recognize that yes I am having this moment but there are others who are having another moment and can I help their moment in any way a because it takes me out of where I am and makes me feel so much more gratitude. Um, and so if I were to say anything concrete, I've, I've noticed in myself when I'm feeling low, if I reach out to a friend and we solve someone's problem, their problem, my problem, it just makes, it makes me feel just so fulfilled and like, ah, this is like the community that I've been trying to build. Mm -hmm. So I would say reach out to people. Mm, reach out to people and reach out and as the book says you know reach out even to those who are different or those you, you don't connect with or feel yeah. that you connect with because we are all interconnected I yeah I really appreciate that listening curiosity generosity <laughs> connection with self um, and then there are these incredible 14 principles so I really encourage everyone to please grab yourself a copy of the book um, and dive into this wonderful, um, yeah, this wonderful principle of Ubuntu, um, as told by Mongi um, and others who have contributed, as you said, to the book. Thank you so much, Mongi, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you again, both for like having this time to share with us about Ubuntu. And, you know, what I was thinking also is how related to the golden rule, which is like the big, the, big, the principle that the Charter for Compassion started with, how right. related it is to, especially now your last part of the message, you know, like how, how other people start feeling, putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes is such a crucial part to understand that like I am who, you know, I am because we are golden mm -hmm. rule related. So that was very powerful. Mungi, we understand that you have plenty to do and you have a busy schedule, so you are welcome. Yes, sorry, to... I have to hop to another author's book launch, so I'm going to try and support, but thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Best of luck with everything. And again, so grateful that you were able to share with, with us your thoughts and your feelings about your book. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. And as Mungi is leaving, we are here to welcome also um, Antoinette Ruzdota and Pato Anton. Let me see if we can ask them, ask to start video. Antoinette, I just try to ask you to start video. And, and there she is. And you are muted. So ask to unmute. There you are. Hi, Antoinette. How are you? Greetings, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so as people have been, you know, learning about this event today, we are, we had the opportunity and an amazing blessing to hear from Mungi about her book, Ubuntu. But now you are here to tell us a little bit about, about the documentary slash film. You are part of the production team of the spirit of Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. So please, would you like to like, tell us where you are, what you've been doing, what is the movie about? Like, we just want to hear it all. Okay, all right. Well, where do you want me to start and where do you want me to begin with? How did it come to pass? Like, what, where did it come the idea to start this document? Like, where, yeah. How come you decided to create a documentary well, about- from the Charter for Compassion, uh, Gar Jameson was at the Parliament of World's Religion back in 1999. And he attended the um, 
at the parliament, he was in a workshop with Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, where they talked about the spirit of Ubuntu. When he sent a message to Pato and myself, he felt that this was such an urgent time that this message needed to be brought across to the world. He stated that he felt it should have been brought earlier, especially as we're watching and witnessing what is happening around the world, worldwide. So we embarked on 10 African countries to shoot about the spirit of Ubuntu, even though it's coming from the Bantu dialect from the Bantu people in South Africa and how it was represented in all of the other different countries that we shot the documentary in. So with that being said, we found the spirit of Ubuntu. <laughs> and it's amazing the, the work that has been accomplished when people actually come together in the spirit of collaboration versus the spirit of competition. This is not like any other type of thing where it's just charities where I've been witnessing charities after charities after charities and organizations handing out and then wondering why have things have not changed and why the cycles have continued to exist. So what we've realized is that when people didn't work either through the politics of government or through the different direct charities of handing outs, that when people were actually coming together, what they were able to build together and what they were able to create together from absolutely nothing and from absolutely the worst conditions. If anybody who has witnessed the documentary, as I did a screening before, and they were sitting there looking at like how amazing to sit there and see all these hospi this hospital being built and another hospital being built by the people themselves with their own hands, brick by brick, to be able to sit there and watch schools being built I mean, so much even happened even after we shot the documentary of amazing things coming together. Watching one organization partner with another organization to be able to grow, to be able to plant, to be able to feed, to be able to support, to be able to empower, to be able to educate, to be able to strengthen, to be able to love, to be able to forgive, to be able to see what can accomplish from the spirit of the heart when people are coming together in alignment in the spirit of Ubuntu. Wow. So That's currently, awesome. Pato is right now, he's supposed to be here with us right now, but he's having a bit of complications in Kenya as we speak. But when we say, this is Africa, you know, so we always know there's always going to be complications, but we always work through the complications. And for people who are not understanding, it's a very different world looking outside into Africa and how things are working through in Africa. They have to work with very limited resources and with the best that they can. You know, I mean, I have to hand it to you guys how you put on the festival, considering, you know, all the load shedding that is happening here when you don't have access to emails, you don't have access to internet, and you don't have access to power. And this goes all the way across the board, not just really with the haves and have nots, but it's it's pretty, you know, it's eye opening to see how you have to get things accomplished and what you can accomplish in what little time or energy or resources that you actually have. That spirit of how people can come together, with little or nothing, can produce very amazing things. And when the rest of the world starts to see that spirit of collaboration versus competition, it's a beautiful thing because there's no one against each other. They're coming to work together, and it doesn't even matter who they are or what color they are, the people who are coming together and working together in the spirit of collaboration is moving humanity forward in ways that is bringing peace and justice. And that's something that I wanted to learn about when I came here to South Africa. What does Ubuntu mean as far as justice and peace and love and forgiveness? Well, Beautifully said. Mm. Um, I know, I, I mean, we've uh, had the pleasure of having Antoinette and Pato at the festival at the Ubuntu Festival, who they both performed and then also, you know, um, uh, uh, allowed us to have a viewing, a uh, screening of the, the spirit of Ubuntu. Um, and the feedback from that has just been incredible. Um, just in terms of like the process of the filming, um, which is something, it's a question that a lot of people ask, the process of filming. Um, as you said, there's so many challenges. Can you can you just share a little bit of, well, about you know what that story of you know ten different African countries with, um, well, you know, 
It's drama, drama, drama. <laughs> you know, anybody who's traveled, if you travel in the United States, it's kind of easy. And you know, if you travel in Europe, you know, with the, with the European Union, you don't need visas. You can travel into France and, and Amsterdam and Germany and, and just get off a plane, grab your bags, jump in a cab and just go. But in Africa, you need a visa in almost every single country. You have to fill out these applications months in advance. You have to either send out your passport, hope to God you get your passport back in time. You don't know what's happening. Or you do a visa on arrival, or you're doing like a multicultural, multi-country visa, like East African visas or these types of visas. And then even after the visas, after you go through all of that, when you get into these countries, you're in there for hours again with more visas, paperwork. It's a lot of paperwork, a lot of paperwork, a lot of paperwork. So basically, when you get into that country, you're basically at that airport. It could be, it's not going to be an hour, it's, you know, when you land. It's not going to be two hours. It could be three hours, four hours, five hours, six, seven, eight, nine hours. And especially when you're traveling with equipment, you know, um, our, our, uh, the director, Kudzai, I mean, he's fantastic. He had to go through so much logistics and paperwork with the government in order to bring his expensive camera equipment into these countries. And then they don't believe you, you know, so in case they think this might be fraud or something else. And then it's funny, I have a lot of back behind the scenes of the documentary. And there was one time we were sitting in one country, we were there for five hours and poor Kudzai was so stressed out because when they were taking in the drones and other things like that, they had, um, I saw a room where everybody's electronics were in there. I don't know if it was every, I mean, they confiscated everybody's things. And then you have to do some different things like bribing to get the stuff back, you know? So we paid a lot of bribes. <laughs> we had to bribe everybody to get all our stuff back. And then they would keep it in another warehouse. That wasn't even like one building. There's a warehouse that he had to go to where they had a warehouse full of all these things. So looking at the logistics of, of how these things are going, it's a little bit difficult, a little bit challenging, but we were determined. We're like, nothing's gonna stop us. We're gonna get in there. And as soon as we get out of the airport and we're all drained and tired and exhausted and everybody's just like, oh, and then you see, you know, who we're meeting and how happy they are. And then that shifts. Everything changes. Everything changes because everybody was so excited that we had reached and that we were coming to see them and we were coming to tell their story. And that's all they wanted was, please, somebody tell our story, see our story, see what's happening, see what we're doing. Nobody knows what's coming out of Africa, but it's on the rise. And it's so beautiful if people see what they're doing. Mm. I mean, and with all those challenges, the film is such a triumph, right? It it really does capture those stories so beautifully. Um, I'm wondering if there is a particular story um, from the 10 that <laughs> is, yeah, that, that resonates or still sits with you, um, you know, even post the filming and we have this beautiful, you know, film. Uh, what is the story that really still resonates with you? You know, I think, um, I think my favorite story, there's so many favorite stories in there, like I said, because, um, you know, I know some of the people in the film, but um, when we shot the film, I started to work with some of the students in Burundi and um, I, I was so impressed with how intelligent and how bright and how spiritual and how loving they were. I, you know, you'll, you'll start to see the things unraveling, but they've been sending me messages of some stuff they've been working on. And, um, and I said, these kids were so much smarter than our kids back in America. And I thought, I said, what if these kids could talk to these kids in America because these kids are geniuses. When I say they're geniuses, they can, you know, and I was like, Michael, you're so, this was kid Michael, he was accepted into Harvard. And I was like, he was such, he's studying to be a doctor, but something that he, he, he did, I don't even know if he can get in because of the visa issues. You know, that's a whole nother issue. That's another problem about getting Africans into America, into these schools that they're being accepted, but they're being denied. Visa applications for Africans are being denied exponentially. We gotta change that, we gotta fix that. This kid, I was walking down and I heard some singing 
from these kids, and I thought it was so beautiful. We made a, a, a video of it later, and I said, what was going on? And um, he said, they don't teach um, spirituality or, or things like that in the schools, you know, because that's an outside thing. But it was his personal idea to sit there and uplift the students because they were away from home. They've all left their villages, and you know, from the poorest, 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 poorest village, and they are living on this campus. And because they're lonely, missing family and home, he gathered them up together, and he would offer church service with them. Yeah. And he would preach, and then, you know, I mean, he's a preacher. And then he would talk to the students, and they would sing, and they would read verses. And, and he actually created a whole another world within that community already, even though they were doing so many different things. And I was like, that was so amazing. So when he sent me that video, and the girls started working, I said, listen, you guys are going to help me with Stand Up For Justice. I love your artwork. I love how you're telling the story. You're telling your own Ubuntu story. You're telling your own African history that we don't even know about. Natalie, Amy, you know, and Princia. She says, I know African history. You know, if you see the African history that we've been studying and researching, I'm like, what? We're cut off from African history in our country. We're being censored from learning. You know, they're censoring Martin Luther King as we speak in half of the states. And they know things that we don't know. And they're able to share things that we, you know, about African American history that we don't even know. And I said, wow, what if you guys start coming together? They start compiling videos. They started working on the content. They made a video for Pato when they came to Burundi with a hundred uh, I am Ubuntu quotes of everything that they want to promote Ubuntu wise. They're waiting for me to sit there and set the time. Every week they contact me. When are we meeting? When are we working? When are we going to get together? What can we do? So since that time, it's been it's always been on me, you know, thinking about them and thinking about how they want to move forward in life and how everybody else wants to move forward in life. And then also at the same time, we see all the others too that we've also helped and supported and how desperate they're in need because how do you tell one person who's doing so much success with how they're growing and then somebody else is just trying to eat, yeah. you know? And it takes a lot because you know as well as I know and everybody else knows you can't help every single person on this planet, you know? Yeah. But you can help around with the circles that you're creating with the Ubuntu circles and family and the people that are in alignment with you. So we do the best that we can and we try to get our rest and we try to move forward and we keep on trying to see the beauty in everything and we try to encourage everybody else, you know, that they can also too, once they start seeing that beauty, can also be able to thrive as well. We're stronger together in this. Absolutely. One thing I love about the the film is that it does show such a such a different story. I think that we've seen coming out from um, you know these ten different African countries. Um, it just gives us such an enlightened perspective of what is happening on the continent and what is possible, um, and also what we can learn, the lessons we can glean at this at this time. Um, and I mean, I I'm just curious about what what is one lesson. Um, that you think people can learn from watching this film, from engaging with it, from maybe even screening it within their community. Um, yeah, what is that one lesson? Peace. I've seen what peace looks like. You know, so every time, you know, like in the States, we've been censored about what's been happening in the Middle East. You know, in fact, they've gone so far. That's why I've been so adamant about encouraging all Africans and everybody here. You know, let's get on to media. Let's get on to marketing. Everybody needs to tell their own stories. The stories need to come out of Africa. They need to come out instead of other people telling these stories. Because what we're seeing in the States, they censor and they block and they shadow ban and they spent hundreds of millions of dollars to not allow certain types of access. That is the reason why they are being having this fight against TikTok in the United States, you know, because there's it's very complicated, but we we have to sit there and say if it hadn't have been for TikTok, we would not be seeing what is happening in Palestine. We would not be seeing what's wit witnessing for real what is actually happening there. So 
But also, when you're seeing all that madness and destruction and everybody, like everybody in the States, when they see things that's hard, they get angry. It makes them more angry and makes them more mad. And it's like the point is when we're going through racial justice and other things, it's like we're not supposed to get more angry. We're not supposed to get more mad. We're supposed to get find more love and to find more solutions. We can't fight <laughs> anger with anger. You know, we have to go back into that love and the forgiveness and everything else. So what I've witnessed and what I've seen was the peace. Because what that was happening there and in, in quite a few instances in that documentary, especially Rwanda and Burundi and those neighboring areas, those people came from that. They were refugees for their entire life. Their entire life, they were thrown out into the far reaches outside and they had to come back. And when that man, Deo, that he's like, he was living on that mountain for a year, homeless. When he pointed, it's so quick in the video, but he pointed at it. He said, that's the spigot. This is where I was getting my water. And those village people came and fed him every single day. And he said Hutu and Tutsis together had to sit there and lay the foundation brick by brick by brick. Mm -hmm. It was only, you know, not too long ago, they chopped each other up in madness and violence and murder and mayhem. But that love and forgiveness, you saw them all smiling. You don't even know which one is Hutu or Tutsi. You saw them all smiling and dancing together. You saw that building. If you see on that mountain, none of that was there before. Not that big old hospital, not the first hospital, not the school. None of those buildings was up there. There was nothing up there. The fires had taken everything. It was just him and a spigot and some water and his determination when he had absolutely nothing. But that thrive and his love for his people. And that's what I feel a lot of people are feeling. And it's not just African diaspora, but just people of like mind, people in alignment. And we realize that all skin folk are kin folk. We've got to join hands with everybody who wants to see this work and make this happen. And that's why I really appreciated, you know, Kate's, um, you know, comment about, you know, what does that look like in the future? Besides, it's not competition, it is collaboration. Because everybody that is joining hands together is succeeding. There is no I in Ubuntu. Everybody who's joining hands is succeeding in Ubuntu philosophy, teachings, and principles. I see it, you know. Yeah, yeah, it speaks to, I think, the strength of the human spirit, as Mungi was saying. But that, that imagery of two people who were, um, or two, two cultural groups that were at war coming together to build the foundation of something. And I think in the same way, uh, there's so much space for us to build foundation for peace together. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter where we come from or what our history, um, what our history is, there is opportunity for that still. Um, so that I think is really, really beautiful. I wonder if there are any questions um, I see there's a question from from Marilyn. Marilyn, would you would you like to speak to your question? Well, I was as I was listening to Antoinette on, um, you know, thinking about Ubuntu, thinking about you know the very fact that it is a philosophy, and that you know as a philosophy, what it does is it really um, brings to reverence. Um, a celebration of common humanity, that if we don't have respect uh, for, you know, as, as the saying goes, I am because you are, um, that we're not going to move forward. And as we look at the history, like, for example, of Rwanda, um, you know, I'm... I guess I'm torn by the current history, the lack of perhaps democracy that is occurring in Rwanda, but what has preceded um, the what's happening today and what happened um, between the two groups, that where are we heading, but that we have to really rely on common humanity, a respect for others, but also the social responsibility that we have to have for others. Um, and, um, you know, the, 
the whole notion, I mean, think about the accomplishments of Rwanda. Uh, it could not have occurred without reconciliation and the ability to forgive. And I guess maybe an essential question is how is it that Ubuntu promotes, allows us to forgive and reconcile with those who have done harm to us? I mean, Rwanda is, is going to be repeated again now um, with the Palestinians, the Israelis, with the people in um, Somalia, Sudan. Um, and, you know, how, how do you bring people to that understanding of, of the core of Ubuntu? The women will... That's that's how they did it in Rwanda. <laughs> in fact, because I asked her, because um, you know this woman, she said, she said after the men did all their stuff, even though they have a male president, I believe fifty one percent of the parliament is women, and his cabinet is full of women. And when they said after all that mess and everything, they said because women are fixers and cleaners, they said they had to clean up all of the mess. And so it was really difficult from what the, from what they explained to me was, you know, making these changes, you know, but they had to do it in order for it to be that clean. You know, they said it was like, it, like they really had, it, they said it was how difficult to make those changes, but then they're like saying now, they really welcome the changes. Because like, if you go into Rwanda, you won't find a cigarette butt, you know, like on the ground. I looked, you know, I when they said that, because I didn't believe they, so I walked around, just looking everywhere because I know what litter looks like everywhere else. And I'm like, there's going to be cigarette butts. There's going to be some cigarette butts somewhere. But I couldn't find, you know, it's like the way they, they just took care of everything, the way they made people wear helmets, the way they started implementing their laws, and the way they were doing different things. So it's kind of weird that they're right on the border of Uganda. So I kind of heard that, like, Rwanda part, people would go into Uganda to party and then come back into Rwanda so that way they can be good people again <laughs> or something. So it's like, all right, this is a bit interesting because it's two different countries with two different political parties, and they're running it two different ways. But the women are the ones... And as, as you saw, like with Alpha, you know, she's like, we got to do better. And the way she made it so international, you know, there's, when I'm seeing white people coming into Africa that they're bringing their children, I'm like, that's amazing. I'm like, you feel comfortable enough to sit there and bring your children and raise your children here and to work here, even in some of the most remote and some of the most difficult places that people always thought was crazy, dangerous, or violent. I'm like, wow. I'm like, we're going to start organizing some trips. There's like, I mean, there's some places here that you would love in South Africa. There's places you would love in Rwanda and different other places that people can come from all over the world into Africa. That is just beautiful and amazing and it's safe and secure when you're with the right people and you see how it flows. It's very beautiful. And it can be beautiful, despite all the ugliness that everybody is being shown. You know, there's beautiful work that's being done by these women. Mm, absolutely, I think, I, I, I hear that. If I could take a stab at that question, um, to say that I think the way we've conceptualized Ubuntu um, around common humanity, I think is step one. Ubuntu is such a deep term. It's actually really, 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 really so so complex um, and really, really deep. And I think when we speak about common humanity, we're at the surface level. And I think step one um, is, Marilyn, a recognition, yes, of our common humanity. It's the recognition that um, we cannot exist in peace without the other, that the suffering of one is the suffering of all. And mm. it's a, that is, I think, a very deep recognition that we have to start with, is that we are connected. Um, and it's when we can recognize our connection that we start, start the process of healing. But I think we have to then take a step deeper and take another further step. And I think this is part of the conversation that, or the questions that came up uh, with Mungi was around, well, you know, how do we change systems? And I think that idea of, you know, forgiveness 
forgiveness is important and we need it. Um, but we also have to be careful about what we mean when we speak about forgiveness and make sure that it's not sort of like a, 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 a false or a sort of a, a, a platitude, but that it is truly centered in the, the decision and the need to heal. Um, and that requires that requires us to look at the circumstances that caused the issue in the first place or caused the, mm -hmm. the conflict um, and work to solve that. That's part of Ubuntu is to say that we still have a responsibility um, that recognizing our common humanity is also recognizing the circumstances in which our com common humanity exists and shifting that. So Ubuntu plays to all, to not just the interpersonal, I think it plays to the systemic as well. And mm -hmm. those are steps that um, I think the film speaks beautifully to. It speaks to how we are in the system that might make us not see our common humanity that it encourages us we're still able to be in the system and see and act against what the system tells us or how the system tells us to act so that we can recognize the dignity and the common humanity within each and every single one of us and so I think that to me is one of the big lessons just watching the film that's just yeah so beautifully done um that we are working in a world that sometimes pushes us to alienate, to individualize, to separate ourselves. And Ubuntu is a call within that to say, but how do I how do I step out of that? How do I reach into the humanity, the goodness, the the curiosity towards goodness, the goodness of others, I think is is what is so to me so powerful about this film and the message of the film is that we can do something even in the structures and the structures change when we do something um, in recognizing our common humanity. Um, so that would be my, my, my offering to a question that I think is, is beautiful. We are, oh, sorry, go ahead, Marilyn. No, I was just going to say thank you. I, I did have one question for you, Babala, and that is, um, how do youth, and I, I'll, I'm just going to say in Cape Town, because that's probably what you know the best, um, how do you <clears throat> honor Ubuntu, do you think? So, I mean, Antoinette was at the festival. And so <laughs> I think we had four days of engaging that very question. I think, I think this young generation is disappointed in Ubuntu. It's disappointed in how the principle has in some ways been used uh, as, as a tool um, that has silenced them, that has marginalized them. And so I think how young people are conceptualizing Ubuntu now and how young people are wanting to really honor the principle is by um, number one, deeply understanding that Ubuntu is a responsibility. I think Antoinette said that there is a, a responsibility to it. I am responsible firstly for myself. I am responsible for what I do within my community and how I show up in my community. Um, and I think then the second part of that is then that idea of stories. So going back to what this film does, which is, yeah, capturing the stories that show the best parts of our humanity and show us what is possible and using that as a way to sort of um, move this conversation of Ubuntu forward. Um, and I think what we're deeply also recognizing as young people is how do we put Ubuntu, how do we include it in our in our workspaces, in our economy, in our politics, in you know these different systems? How do we do that? How do we shift that? And I think that's the conversation that young people are starting to to really dive into. There's something very interesting that a participant said at the festival, which is that you know structures like capitalism actually cannot exist any longer without Ubuntu. We are at that point in our society of crisis where, you know, our economies will not survive if they don't incorporate this idea of Ubuntu. Our politics, our politics, every single day, people on the ground are asking for 
Ubuntu, our humanity, to be recognized in policies that we make, right? In the politics that we have. And so those are those are the questions I think that young people are grappling with. And I think they're honoring them by participating in conversations, by participating in that work and being quite intentional about what they're asking for in their in their environment, in their world. And of course, um, in our environment as in the earth, right? Our relationship with the earth is as well is very important because that is part of what it means to exist in Ubuntu. It's the recognition that I am because there is air and there are trees. And I am because Marilyn is sitting in that chair. And I am because of me waking up this morning and deciding to be here. I am here because there is a force, a force of compassion perhaps that is putting me in this space. And so I exist here because of very different elements and very different things that exist within me and without me. And there is a need for us to honor each and every single element of that. 100, girl, <laughs> 100. I always love that about you and everything because it's, it's, it's so true. In, and I'm witnessing that while I'm here, you know. So I'm excited when I go into Joburg tomorrow to meet uh, with the students you know, so, and to hear from them. And I thank you for mentioning the earth because after coming from M Mpumalanga, you know, where I was able to connect and ground and meditate and, and start manifesting some amazing things and some rites of passage, it's like, it is all connected. As above, so below. You know, this is, it's all connected and everything that has been leading me on this is reverting right back to the land again, right back to the spirituality again, right back to, all this interconnectedness with everyone once again you know we are we are moving and and i was noticing that because i was telling somebody i said in america chris rock said if they minimum wage if they could pay you any less they would you know and that's a sad thing that they would have minimum wage if they could pay you any less than that that's the bare minimum. They would pay you less than that. So people who are actually making minimum wage in this country and in America or in any minimum wage anywhere else is the bare minimum. It is, you don't even, it doesn't even give you the bare necessities of food and water and electricity and clean water and things like that. That bare minimum is not going to work in the future if we are actually seeing each other as human beings as one family. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for being here, for joining us on this webinar. Antoinette, thank you so much for your words, for your experience, for what you're sharing. Babs, I don't even know where to begin with you. Thank you so much for not only facilitating, but also being an incredible example of Ubuntu and an educator of Ubuntu to all of us. And um, Marilyn, thanks for joining us to ask questions as well. This has been an incredible session, and I am um, truly grateful for learning more about Ubuntu and trying to apply everything that I learned today into my life. And I, honestly, I mean, I'm still shocked at how in commonality it has with the Golden Rule, which makes me jump into announcements. We have Golden Rule Day celebrating on April 5th, this Friday. We have tons of different panels, so many different things going on. We're talking about Ubuntu. We're talking about politics. We're talking about... Um, um, uh, veganism and how to respect everyone on the earth. Three dollars and the earth as you want to be treated. How important that is. Next, we have our Charter Earth Series, the Global Reader, Tuesday, April 9th. We have the 10 Green Commandments. This is part of Earth Month series. And um, all the links, I'm putting them on the chat as a matter of fact, so that anyone can access those. There they are. And uh, this conversation is going to be moderated by Dr. Johnson Isaac Kuretaram and Jennifer Wilhoit. Um, it's going to be a really good conversation. And then our next global read is with Rabbi Laura Duhan Kaplan with Mouth of the Donkey. We uh, and this will be um, this will be facilitated by the Interfaith Amigos since Rabbi Laura is part of the Interfaith Amigos. So this is going to be a really fun conversation as well. And we have a course with Kate Trinka, Compassion and Care for Creation, a self-directed course that can start any time after, since yesterday, until June 1st. And all that is open and you can check that out on our website. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll be seeing you again on the next Global Read happening in one week. Thanks, Antonio, for coming again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, let's